Everybody, I'm Paul Peppis. I'm the director of the Oregon Humanities Center. And I want to welcome you to this, the second in the OHC's public lecture series on this year's theme of the common good. Our speakers on this theme will provide a variety of perspectives on the common good, how we understand it and how it ought to work or how it does work in our lives and the lives around us. But before I formally introduce our speaker, uh, Nalini Nadkarni, I have a couple of brief announcements as always. Uh, you've seen as you came in our information table in the, out there where you can find out about upcoming OHC sponsored and co-sponsored events and you can sign up for our mailing list. Uh, Professor Nadkarni has agreed to uh, Q&A after the lecture. Um, since we're live streaming it, we'd like you to come to the microphones um, and if you can't come, let us know and we'll bring you a mic. Um, try to speak into the microphone so everybody at home can hear you. I also need to give my customary thanks. First, thanks to our collaborators in EMU Event Services and at the Center for Media and Educational Technologies for their logistical and technical support. Thanks, as always, to the OHC's incomparable staff, our Associate Director, Gina Turner, our Program Coordinator, Melissa Gustafson, our Communications Coordinator, Peg Gearhart, and our Student Assistant, Greta Blankenship. And last but not least, thanks to our generous donors. If you want to join them in supporting the OHC in our public and research programs, please pick up a donation envelope on the information table on your way out. Our great staff, collaborators, and generous patrons make it possible for the OHC to organize public humanities events and host world-class scholars and public intellectuals like our speaker tonight, forest ecologist and professor of biology at the University of Utah, Nalini Nutkarni. Professor Nutkarni will present this year's Robert D. Clark Lecture in the Humanities. The Clark Lecture was established in 1994 and has been sustained since then through the generosity of the Oregon Community Foundation. We're grateful for the Foundation's steadfast support of the humanities and the OHC. The Clark Lecture aims to promote public discussion on the natural sciences, the history of Oregon, and the interface between science and social and cultural affairs. As exemplified by Thomas Condon, frontier missionary, geologist, paleontologist, and founding member of the University of Oregon. The lectureship was named in honor of former UO President Robert D. Clark, author of The Odyssey of Thomas Condon. The Clark Lectureship's emphasis on the public discussion of natural sciences and the interface between science and social and cultural affairs, as well as our theme, uh, a focus on the common good, help explain why we've chosen Nalini Nadkarni as this year's Clark Lecturer. Professor Nadkarni's research interests include community and ecosystem ecology of tropical and temperate forest canopies, the effects of forest fragmentation on biodiversity and community function, and the development of database tools for canopy researchers. In addition, Nadkarni is deeply committed to pu public engagement with science. She has developed novel ways to share scientific knowledge with a wide range of public audiences. She actively promotes the partnering of scientists and artists to enhance conservation of forests. And she has created a range of programs to bring science and nature to the incarcerated. Nod Carney is the author of Between Earth and Sky, Our Intimate Connections to Trees, and co-editor of Forest Canopies and Monteverde Ecology and Conservation of a Tropical Cloud Forest. Given Professor Nod Carney's scientific expertise and her commitment to science communication and collaboration between the sciences and the humanities, there's little doubt that her Clark Lecture tonight, Tapestry Thinking, Weaving the Threads of Humans and Nature, will provide us with a rich and illuminating perspective on our theme of the common good. Please join me in welcoming Nalini Nankarni. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, I've just been delighted this day, this evening, of conversations with people here at the University of Oregon to uh, foster the same sense that I have that science, nature, and people are inextricably inclined and intertwined with um, what I think of as a tapestry, a tapestry of interactions that bring together people, organisms, interactions, and species uh, that make um, 
make, make what nature is important to people. And I think one of the reasons was I was invited here was to address the question of why people in nature are not so entwined. The fact that people in nature are being separated and how a scientist such as myself might try to make those threads, those interactions more complete, more, um, more present. And what I'd like to do tonight is to think about this very tiny poem that Rabindranath Tagore Kavor, take, uh, has given to me, this idea of the tapestry of life's story is interwoven with the threads of life's ties ever breaking and joining. And what I'd like to talk to you tonight is really about that tapestry, the tapestry between humans and nature. And I'll bring my own scientific perspective as a scientist, as a forest ecologist, who has spent really the last part of my research time, the last part of my professional time, not only in terms of understanding the intricate ties of nature that occurs in forest ecosystems, forest canopies in particular, but also the ties between humans and nature. And I think this is something that all of us are thinking about, all of us are questioning about, all of us are concerned about, not only in terms of us as people, but also as science administrators, for example, uh, people like uh, Franz Kodafer, who is the new director of the National Science Foundation, Alice uh, Leshner, who is the AAAS uh, CEO, CEO Emeritus, who's calling for scientists to, be, to become more about not only the understanding of their science, but also becoming ambassadors to science, ambassadors who can bring science and nature and people together. I think we have been seeing scientists who are now becoming more activistic, more um, realizing that we have a role as scientists to uh, engage with people. Uh, this was evidenced, I think, by the March for Scientists, which took, a, uh, took place last year, that literally millions of scientists were, for, were marching for scientists, were saying that we as scientists need to interact with, with people. And so what I'd like to do tonight is to me as a scientist who has been studying forest canopies, who's been studying the interactions of forest um, ecology. Uh, first of all, what I'd like to do is talk about my own uh, experiences in forest canopy research. I'd also like to talk about connecting forests to people. And finally is to uh, talk about scientists and the common good, which is really the theme of what the Center for um, uh, Environmental uh, Humanities are talking about in terms of the common good. And I'd like to talk first about my own background as an individual. Uh, this is my parents. This is my father, who was a forest or who was a scientist. My mother, uh, who was a forest, uh, sci uh, who was a communicator, and myself as a little kid who just loved climbing trees. That was really my inter first interaction with forest ecology that led me to think about the fact that I needed to think about how I might bring forests and trees as being important beings um, that were important to me as a kid to other people. Um, as a graduate student, I decided to take uh, forest ecology as a profession uh, to be a forest scientist and studied the forest canopy, which at that point was really about a new biotic frontier, a place where people were trying to understand this frontier of forest canopy science. Uh, we use forest um, uh, walkways as one ways to get to that. We used um, uh, canopy cranes as one way to do that. But we also use that as a uh, uh, we also used uh, forest balloons, for example, as a way to do that. We also looked at um, one piece of forest canopy access, uh, which I use now today. Um, and I'll just give you a little bit of a Uh, using mountain climbing techniques to get up into the forest canopies 
to get in, in, intimate in terms of understanding what is going on in the forest, can it be rainforest? You know, so, sort of who can resist doing that sort of uh, work in terms of canopy research? And I guess I would ask at this point, uh, who would like to join me in that sort of research? What I found when I got into the forest canopy, and if you were to join me climbing into the forest canopy, I think what you would experience, as I did, this really different ecosystem, this really different place in terms of canopy research, which is a place where what we encounter is a very different microclimate, a place where there's much greater input of, of, of sunlight, uh, a much more, a greater amount of wind, a much greater extreme in terms of uh, relative humidity and, and temperature. And what we find in that microclimate of the forest canopy is that what we find is that there are many animals and plants that have adapted to the canopy ecosystem. Uh, plant, uh, animals like the, the three-footed sloth, snakes, uh, plants that live in the forest canopy for all or part of their whole, eco, for their whole lifestyle. And I'm just going to tell you a little bit about one aspect of um, that canopy microcosm, which are the insects. And one of the reasons I'm interested in the canopy is not only because of the diversity of insects that live up there, but also sort of a personal aspect, which is when I was started studying the forest canopy, I encountered this guy, uh, who is an antaxonomist, who became my future husband. Jack Mongeneau, and he said, Nalini, if you marry me, I will name an ant species after you. And I'm like, who can resist that? And in fact, he named an ant after me, Procryptosterus nalinii, but he also named an ant after every single member of my own family, uh, Nalini Carney, and Jack, and uh, August, and Erica. And so that sort of is a funny story, but in fact, that ecosystem, that mini, miniature part of the forest ecosystem began to capture my imagination, began to act, act, uh, sort of imperil me with this sense of what is going on in the forest canopy. And there were these canopy dwelling plants, what are called canopy epiphytes. Epi meaning a pond, phyte meaning plants, plants that live in the forest canopy, deriving not nutrients from the host trees. That is, they don't put their roots into the trees themselves, but they derive their nutrients, their water, their life cycles from, um, outside, from sources outside the canopy. So these are vascular plants that take nutrients and water from rainfall, from nutrients contained in that rainfall and mist interception from the canopy itself. And I began thinking about how could I come to understand what is going on with those canopy dwelling plants and how they might interact with the forest as a whole. And so I began working in a place called Monteverde, Costa Rica. How many people have, might have been here who might have visited Costa Rica already? So you understand that these ecosystems of Monteverde, Costa Rica are really just amazing ecosystems on our planet. What I learned from the studies that I have done, what my students have done, what my colleagues have done, is that these canopy dwelling plants are not just these isolated little plants that live in the canopy, but that they actually interact with the ecosystem as a whole. That in fact, 60% of the nitrogen that comes in the form of rain and mist and fog to these tropical montane forests are actually captured and intercepted by these canopy dwelling plants. We also have learned that these canopy dwelling plants are also important in terms of the birds, the arboreal mammals that take advantage of the resources 
that these canopy dwelling plants provide. And so I became very interested in if the, the question of whether, if these plants are so important in terms of ecosystem level interactions, what happens if they are disturbed? What happens if a canopy dwelling uh, insect or animal such as a primate or a visiting arboreal uh, visitor such as myself might kick off uh, a, a, a group of plants in the forest canopy, how might they be uh, intercepted or how might they be affected in, the inter in, in terms of the forest ecosystem as a whole? And so I carried out a number of experiments where I actually stripped off these branch ecosystems, these epiphytic communities, and looked at what happened after they were disturbed. Well, I had predicted that because these epiphytic communities are so vibrant, are so sort of lush, so diverse, so interactive in the community, that they would come back very quickly. But what I found, in fact, was that it took a very long time for them to respond to disturbance. So here you see a graph of what I did. I stripped these epiphytes off their branches in year zero, and it took 13 to 14 years for them to respond at all. And in fact, it took about 22 years for them to come back in any sort of significant way. I had also thought that they would just sort of encroach from the side. But what, what I found was that instead of encroaching from the side, they actually began growing from the bottom of the branch, growing up and around that branch, and it took that long for them to recover. So what I realized then was something that I'd like to sort of put in your mind in terms of an, a, a visual effect, which is, it took a very long time for them to grow back, and if they were very lucky, they would sort of, sort of grow back from the bottom up and, and grow back and coalesce around. <laughs> well, we might laugh about this, but what I also realized as a tropical biologist, working in these tropical ecosystems is that I needed to understand what was going on in terms of disturbance of tropical rainforests. I began observing myself that, in fact, many tropical rainforests were encountering disturbances that fragmented tropical forests, that disturbed tropical rainforests. And I needed to understand what was going on in terms of disturbance of these tropical rainforests, as well as what was going on in tropical primary forests as well. I began thinking about what was going on in terms of climate change how these organisms in the tropical canopy um, were reliant on input of nutrients and water that were provided by cloud and mist that might be disturbed by global climate change. How might that affect the canopy and also as the forest as a whole? And so that really evoked in my mind a question that I think that those who are concerned not only with primary questions of, of biology, but those who are involved with questions of environmental humanities, those who are involved with questions about what is the role of human interactions and biology of, of primary undisturbed systems might think about. And so I began thinking about what might I do as a scientist who might have an effect on people's awareness of what's going on in tropical systems. How could I do something about this? Now, this is something that is not rewarded in the traditional academic system. What is rewarded in the tropical academic system is publishing another paper, publishing or getting another grant proposal funded by the National Science Foundation. But I, as I think many of you understand, is that you know, we are not put here on our planet to think only about our professional obligations. We are also thinking about what should we do as people in terms of what's going on with our planets. And so in 1996, I um, created a um, 
an NGO, a, uh, a non-profit organization called the, National, uh, the International Canopy Network. And in conjunction with that, I began working with other canopy scientists to bring scientifically sound information about forest canopies to the general public. We began writing articles about the forest canopies and saying how important they are, how interesting they are uh, to people who might read something like uh, Smithsonian Magazine or watch a National Geographic video or to read the newsletter that we started producing in the, into the, um, from the International Canopy Network. And indeed we found that this was really like acceptable people who were already interested in trees and forests were very interested in what was produced. But this, it occurred to me, was not enough. It seemed to me that what I was doing in terms of my research, which was producing these very small, very interesting, very important publications in the scientific literature, and these little articles in places like Scientific American or National Geographic was something that was important, but it was already talking to people who already knew that trees and forests were very important to us. And so I began thinking about, well, what about people who are living in cities like Tokyo, for example, where trees are not accessible, where, where little girls do not grow up climbing, climbing trees? How do I get to those people? How do I convince them that trees are important. And I sort of started thinking about this in terms of the things that I think of as not important. Like for me, sports are not important. I don't know about you guys, but I really don't give a darn whether, you know, who wins the World Series in terms of baseball. And so the idea that people are passionate about baseball requires me to think about what would make me passionate about baseball. Well, guess what? <laughs> Baseball bats, it turns out, in the American League and the National League, all these baseball bats have to be made of wood. And they're made of either ash or maple. And so that provides to me a connection to the World Series. Because I wonder, like, are they using bats made of maple or ash or what? Or, so there's a connection. So that brings me to this idea of how do I get a little girl in New York City who may never have the opportunity to climb trees as I did in my little suburban home in Bethesda, Maryland, to climb trees and to be connected to trees, to think of trees as a place of refuge, as a place of a, a, something desirable, how do I get a little girl like that to think about the importance of trees? And so I created a treetop bark, <laughs> and I think that is a really important thing because a lot of little girls really love barbie. And so what my students in my lab did was, was create treetop barbie. Uh, we called up Mattel. And we said, uh, we'd like to interest you in getting Treetop Barbie going. They actually, surprisingly, were not interested in that. But we said, well, fine, well, we will do that ourselves. So I started going out to Goodwill stores and Desiree industry stores. We bought used Barbies. We engaged um, seamstresses who could make little Barbie outfits. We got little helmets that we bought on eBay. And we began creating Treetop Barbie with a little booklet that described the wonder, the science of canopy plants and animals that Treetop Barbie was interested in that might be interesting to six-year-old girls. We also started trying to sell uh, ground for Ken, who actually was not very, uh, uh, very interesting to people, so we sort of have discounted him. But what it really made me understand, and, and we might laugh about this, but this was actually a very significant happening in my own development as a scientist and as a canopy researcher and as more importantly a science communicator, which is to think about how I might thread, how I, bring, I might bring together the threads of the ecological values of trees to the ecological values of what other people might think about the values of trees. And so 
Shita Barbie was an, a recreational value that I was able to knit into the ecological values of trees, but how might, how might I otherwise think about other values, other ways that pieces of society that I may not agree with, but might have interests, might have values to weave together into this tapestry of understanding and values of forest ecosystems. So what I'd like to do now is to talk to you about some of the projects that my students and I have developed to develop the connections between not only the recreational values of trees, which we did with Treetop Barbie, but also the aesthetic values, the spiritual values, and the social justice values that trees might have with other parts of society that I might weave into the ecological values of trees. So let's talk about the aesthetic values of trees and forests. Well, you know, in many ways, this is like a totally easy, easy sell. For centuries, artists, musicians, people involved with aesthetics have been deeply involved with the aesthetic and the aesthetic values of trees. And the way I've gone about linking the aesthetic values of trees and forests has been to, to create a number of what I call canopy confluences. I've invited a number of artists, of um, musicians, of rap singers, of people who have really never encountered trees to what I, what I think is a really interesting way to involve them, which is to bring them into the forest into the forest canopy to understand and to, for them to express their values, their perceptions, and their ways of communicating the values of forest canopies. So for example, we've brought in a number of musicians, um, people like rap singers, uh, oboe play players, uh, people who play wooden instruments into the forest canopies themselves, for these week-long canopy confluences. Uh, one example is uh, a guy named um, Drew Brady, um, who is one of my students, and he made this rap song about forest canopy. Look up, expand your perspective. Don't click that and don't be so selective. Just another minute and I will leave you alone. Try walking a mile in a different biome. I mean, that's pretty cool, right? And so that was cool, actually, for students who uh, sort of wouldn't see me as an important uh, or as, as someone who's cool. And so what I developed from that was a program called the Sound Science Program. And what I did was I engaged a professional rap singer to come with me to a group of at-risk students, kids, from Tacoma, Washington who are not necessarily too involved with forests or trees, but when they linked up with a caution, who's the name of this professional rap singer, we took him out to forest with these at-risk kids. We interacted with him in the forest of my, uh, the Evergreen State College where I worked. I picked up a maple branch and said, hey, here's a maple tree. And he started talking about or making his own rap song about that maple branch. And then the kids came into our sound studios and began making their own rap songs about uh, the trees and the branches that they incorporated, that they encountered. And so that was something meaningful for them because they honored him. They felt that that was their value instead of just my ecological value of trees. And that to me was a big step in terms of understanding that if I could help them create this rap music video, uh, DVD for them, that they would begin seeing their interaction with trees as something that was of importance to them. Another aspect um, involves fashion. And I think this is very much uh, sort of an applied aspect of aesthetics that many of us really, here in Eugene, Oregon, probably maybe don't think that much about fashion is really an important thing. In fact, I mean, although I, I see that all of you have sort of dressed up to come to this occasion, 
But you know, when you think of ecologists, you think about people like this, and I hate to say it, but my husband is right there in the middle of this, and you know, he's not really dressed up. But in fact, that fashion and what we decide to wear on a given occasion is about our self-identity. It's about who am I? Who do I portray myself in this world? And I thought, well, what if we could use nature? What if we could use canopy-dwelling organisms? What if we could use forest organisms to define who we are? And so this was my first attempt. This was a moss, uh, a moss cape that I created. It wasn't really successful in that it sort of shed mosses, so I couldn't really actually show up at parties. But what I've been doing now is to create a new line of fashion, a new line of eco-fashion, where I take a botanically correct image of a canopy plant, I print it on fabric, I create a garment about it, and with it is an accompanying hang tag that has information about this plant, Piper auretum. Piper auretum is a plant that grows in the Monteverde cloud forest canopy. It is related directly to Piper nigrum, which is the black pepper plant that you put on your, um, on your, on your scrambled eggs every morning. And it is an important and beautiful plant. And so this, um, I'll just show you right here, I'm, I'm wearing this jacket right here, um, that this is something that I think could really be a significant promoter of canopy research, canopy conservation, canopy communication through the medium of, of fashion, something that you and I might not necessarily think is important. So this is something that I'm trying to promote in the world of fashion, an industry that we think of as being overconsumptive, as being a polluter, as being a, something that we don't normally think of as being comrades, of being collaborators, but something that we might think about then as being partners, as being collaborators in terms of carrying out conservation of canopy communities. The other thing I want you to think about is that we don't necessarily have to start our own fashion industry about this, that communication about canopy organisms or about trees or about nature can be something fairly small. For example, one of the things that I started to do now is to actually go to nail parlors. This just takes an hour of my time to get my nails painted with bright green nail polish that also have tree pictures on them when I ask the nail polish person to paint trees on my nails. And so now I can have conversation with young women who really value their nails. Uh, I mean, I don't understand why they would do that, but, but they actually do do that. And so why not use that as a connector? Why not use that as an opportunity to connect ourselves, our values of trees, with people who might value some aspect of what we do with our lives as well. And so really what I'm trying to tell you about is that this connection between aesthetics and ecology is something that can be done at a large scale or at a small scale. It can be do, do something at the largest, largest implication or the smallest implication. And what I'd like to do now is talk a little bit about not only the aesthetic connections between ecological values, but also some of the spiritual connections that might go on. Now, I mentioned before that my dad was from India. My mother was from um, uh, an Orthodox Jewish community. And so I don't have a whole lot of connections between sort of standard religious outlets. But I also know that just opening the first page of the Bible allows me to see that actually trees are quite important. We know about the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And that occurs in the first page of the Bible. So I thought, well, if I need to interact with religious communities, with faith-based communities that historically have been at odds with scientific communities, I might use trees as ambassadors between science and religion. And so I began reading the Bible. And I actually downloaded the Bible, the Old Testament, 
from the web, and I began, I, I looked at, I did a search for all of the references of verses that involve trees and forests, and I found that in fact there were 328 references to trees and forests in the Old Testament. And being a scientist, of course, I had to catalog those or categorize those into these different categories. And I found that, in fact, that in terms of percentages, there were a very large number of references to, Bi the Bible, uh, to trees in the Bible that involved symbolic and aesthetic references, analogies to life and God, pre practical use like uh, fruits and foods uh, in the Bible, uh, location descriptions, tree use, uh, tree loss is bad, or tree biology. I began looking at other religious texts, uh, the Jewish uh, Talmud, the Quran, the um, Bhagavad Gita, uh, a Buddhist text, and I found that in fact there were many references of the spiritual values of trees in those texts. For example, in the Jewish uh, in the Jewish tradition, Tu Shabbat is a is a holiday that commemorates um, the values of trees for people, for Jewish people. Uh, there's a whole Seder, there's a whole sort of special ceremonial uh, dinner that goes along with eating and, and consuming um, the, the fruits and, and the fruits and flowers of, of, um, of trees. Uh, Allah, for example, in terms of the, the um, Muslim religion, there are many references to images of Allah. And people who are in the Muslim religion actually look at trees and they see the image of the word Allah that is written in the form and shape of tree branches. And therefore, trees are regarded as very important religious symbols. And so I put together these religious symbols, these religious verses. I created a sermon about trees and, and spirituality. I started knocking on doors of religious communities. And I said, I am a scientist, but I would also like to share what I know about, what I've learned about the importance of trees in religious traditions. And I would like to share them with your congregations. And not surprisingly, it was the Unitarians who uh, said, sure, come on in. And uh, so they welcomed me in. I was able to take the pulpit. I was able to provide this information, not necessarily as me as a religious person, but me as a scientist who wanted deeply to understand what were the religious values that Unitarians or Presbyterians or Jews or Muslims might have about trees that had been written in their own religious scriptures, their own holy scriptures that I could learn from. So in a way, it was a very kind of humble way of approaching congregations and people that I might have otherwise had a very confrontational uh, interaction with if I was saying evolution versus creation, uh, b between uh, evolution versus evolution, versus create, uh, creationism, but rather I was saying, no, I want to learn what you have said in your own religious scriptures that might inform me about the importance of trees in our lives. And one of the things that I've since been doing has been to map trees in churchyards. Uh, churchyards, of course, hold religious ground, sacred ground in many religious traditions. Uh, that's their sacred ground. They have trees living there. We map, my students and I have mapped um, the trees in these churchyards, and we've created these pamphlets that explain, that produce information about not only the verses that relate to those species of trees in their churchyards, but also the biological information about those tree species that occur in those churchyards. So it allows us to think about commonality between science and religion. It has allowed me, for example, to participate in tree planting uh, opportunities that sometimes the church folks have initiated and sometimes our academic community, my students and I, have initiated. And so it means then that we have some commonality, some common ground, some common good that has come out of these interactions 
between a scientist who knows about the ecological importance of trees and congregants who know about the spiritual, val the spiritual valities of trees to come together to create something of common good. So those are the things that we've worked out so far in terms of recreational, aesthetic, and spiritual grounds. What I'd like to share for you in just the last few minutes is to talk a little bit about some of the common ground that we've been establishing in terms of social justice values. And a lot of social justice uh, occur, uh, grounds, for me at least, occurs when thinking about people who do not have access to nature at all. And you and I can walk around and we can encounter nature as we walk around Eugene and Eugene and its wonderful set of city parks and so forth. We can take a trip out to the mountains. We can take hikes out there. We can go skiing. We can do so many things that connect us to the natural world. But there is a population of people who are denied access of that because of the, because of the the fact that they have committed crimes, that is that they are sequestered from nature because they are incarcerated. There are 2.2 million adults in our country who are now incarcerated, and they are sustaining the implications of that, not only in terms of their separation from their families, from their ability to make money and contribute to society, but they're also suffering, I think, from their lack of access to nature something which I think is really, really difficult. And so one of the things that I've been working on over the last 15 years has been to provide access of science education and of conservation projects to the incarcerated. In 2003, I established a project at the Evergreen State College and the Washington Department of Corrections, which has been bringing science education and conservation projects to the incarcerated. Um, some of these have involved very simple sustainability projects, um, putting in gardens in, in, in uh, prison situations, uh, bringing in beekeeping, bringing in recycling. Uh, we've also been working with, in collaboration with um, conservation groups such as the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife to start partnering with inmates to actually start creating programs that will allow them to rear endangered species that can be then released into protected areas of Washington state and thus allowing inmates to connect to, to contribute to scientific and conservation projects. So in Washington state and now in Utah where I live now, we've been working with inmates to grow 17 species of endangered prairie plants, 300,000 plugs of endangered prairie plants for planting out and releasing into existing restoration projects in Washington state. To allow women inmates at the Washington State Correction in Institution for Women to rear the endangered Taylor, uh, Taylor Checkerspot butterfly for release in endangered and now protected areas. For the men and women who are now incarcerated in the Salt Lake City County Jail, where I live near now, uh, to create kestrel nesting boxes so that we can create better nesting habitats for the American kestrel, which is in decline across, across the nation. So this allows men and women not only to, uh, who are incarcerated, not only to gain some skills in terms of science, in terms of restoration ecology, but also to get a sense that they can themselves contribute to the work that we are all concerned about in terms of helping our planet. And this work has been really well received. We've gotten tremendous amounts of media uh, media coverage, uh, lots of, uh, of, of, of pats on our back in terms of the kinds of coverage that we've involved from Science Magazine to Playboy Magazine. But something that I realized about six months or six years rather into what we were doing is that in fact the people, the inmates that we were encountering 
were those who were minimum and medium security prisoners, that we were not getting into the deepest part of the mass incarceration system of our country. And I felt that I needed, as a scientist and as a person, to not only engage those who are most accessible within these somewhat least accessible systems, but to think about how could I bring nature to the people who are in the deepest part of our mass incarceration system. Those men and women who are incarcerated for sometimes months and years at a time in cells like this, nine by 12 uh, foot um, cell blocks, uh, for months or years at a time. And it seems like, well, I knew that I couldn't bring uh, frogs or butterflies or even science lectures to the men and women incarcerated in the deepest part of this mass incarceration system, but perhaps I could bring nature imagery to them. And we know from the literature in hospitals, for example, we know that when people see nature imagery, even if it's just the view of a tree outside of a hospital window, that, that there's less stress, there's less anxiety, that when you and I walk out and just see some aspect of nature, our levels of anxiety and stress are reduced. Maybe that could be something that we could do. And so I was able to engage uh, with a supermax prison in eastern Washington last year to bring nature imagery by uh, providing uh, uh, just, uh, you know, a, in a very, very small way uh, to ask the uh, staff there to provide a PowerPoint projector, and we provided some nature imagery in the way of nature videos to the men who got to go to their exercise rooms one hour a day during their, during their incarceration time. So we got this up, um, possibility of taking a cell block, which had men who were incarcerated in solitary confinement, that they could see nature imagery in their exercise rooms for one hour a day compared to those men who were not involved with this, who did not see any sort of videos uh, during their exercise times. And what we found was that those men who were exposed to nature imagery actually committed 26% fewer violent infractions than those who were not exposed to nature imagery. And so what we learned then was something of value to not only to us in terms of exposing this very nature-deprived population to nature imagery, but also something of value to the corrections officers, to the corrections administrators, to the corrections staff, who then did not have to deal with as much in terms of violent infractions because those men had been exposed to nature imagery. But I think what was really important was that um, in all of this work with the incarcerated was not so much the impacts on the incarcerated, their exposure to science lectures, their exposure to conservation work, their exposure to nature imagery as what happened to the scientists. That is, as scientists who moved into the system of mass incarceration, as those scientists whom we provided opportunities to interact with incarcerated populations, who then became aware of the fact that there's this whole group of people, this whole group of incarcerated people who are in fact open to science education, can learn about science education, can alter their behaviors because of their exposure to nature imagery. I think that was what really was significant. And so what I'm trying to understand now is how we can relate this tapestry of interactions between scientists and other populations, whether through recreational aspects, through aesthetic aspects, through spiritual aspects or through social justice aspects, how we can fulfill what I think these science administrators are trying to tell scientists that in fact it is important for us as scientists to move into the realm 
of communicating what we know, what we understand, what we value in terms of connecting science and society. And I can't really tell you at this point what I've come up with because I myself am in a stage of trying to understand this. And sometimes I feel at this point of my career of trying to share this with people is I'm, I'm kind of uncertain. I'm kind of not certain. I'm sort of at a place where I'm just asking questions about this. Uh, I kind of wish I weren't because it used to be so easy to just sort of promote science mindlessly, you know, in, in a way that was sort of accepted by science. But I feel like I don't, I can't do that anymore. I think about who is supposed to be weaving this web, weaving this tapestry between science and society. And I have found some ways of doing that. I have drawn upon Barbie, I've drawn upon inmates, I've drawn upon faith-based groups, I've drawn upon rap singers, and I think that there are people here at the University of Oregon who have, have, have started to do that and who are doing that. And I really admire the work that is going on here with environmental humanities that are pushing and pulling in terms of connecting the threads between science and society. I don't think any of us yet have the answers to that. And I, I invite you all tonight, today, to think about, to articulate even, or, and to help me answer the question of what I should be doing as a scientist, as a person, as a mother, as a hiker, as a wood turner of bowls, of, as a person, to make this work happen. And I think this work can be important. And I really thank you for being here tonight to even think about this connection between science and between doing work for the common good, which is really, I think, what, what brought us here together tonight to do. And I think that work is very difficult. But I also think that maybe trees can help us with the answers to that. And that is that this almost intractable problem of what are we to do today to bring together humans and nature, to answer the questions of how do we move people to help nature, that seems like a very, very difficult problem if you look only at the trunk of a tree. But here's the advantage of asking that question as a canopy scientist. Because if you look at the canopy of a tree and you just stand there and you look at what goes on at the tips of the branches rather than only at the trunk of the tree, you can begin to understand that in fact a tree can move. And I've worked at this. In fact, I've asked trees to be artists. I've actually tied little bran the branches of trees with little paintbrushes of green paint and held them up to a piece of canvas and asked them over 30 seconds to say, how much do you move? And I've recorded that on, you know, on, a, on, on a piece of art. And this is the piece of art that a tree has actually created when I put those little green paintbrushes on the twigs of trees. And then, of course, being a scientist, I had to know how far <laughs> these, uh, these, these trees move. How far does this twig move? Well, you can answer that question. You know how you can answer it? Is you can add up all of the, the sum of those segments, the distance of those segments over 30 seconds. You can multiply the number of segments per minute, per year, per twig, per branch. And when you multiply that out, you want, want to guess how far those twigs have moved over an entire year. And would anybody like to guess how, how far a single Douglas fir tree has moved over a year when you look at the twigs, when you look at the movement of the twigs over a year? Three. 
300 feet. How much? 20 miles. You know how much they move? 186,540 miles. That is seven times around our planet. And so when I think of the difficulties, the problems, the difficulties that it takes to make any kind of movement that it might take to change the way people think about trees, the ways that we think about moving people to make changes about nature and about our planet, I think about this. I think about the fact that a single tree can move seven times around the planet if we think in a different way about movement. And so I ask all of you, I invite all of you to think about the ways that each of you might take to move in a small way or a big way how we think about the interactions between what we understand and what, how we might shift the way other people think about our beautiful planet. Thank you. We have time, Paul. Do you think? Do you? I, it's up to you. Uh, I would love to answer any questions or comments or hear from people. I see one person. These these days, uh, I've been seeing a lot in the media about uh, climate change, the effects of climate change. A lot of things about uh, phenomenal uh, melting of the ice at the polar caps. And I think back about Al Gore and his fantastic um, campaign to get people activated about uh, climate change. And that was how many years ago? I can't even remember. You know, 10 years ago or eight years ago. What, what, I think this is part of what you're getting at. How, why do you think? People are so reluctant to grasp that the, the time is beyond, it's beyond time to, to take it, to, to change our ways, to do something different. To uh, so why are people so reluctant to change? Is, is that what well, you're I mean, after, after, you know, people of, you know, prominent people like Al Gore have tried to get it out there and... Why, where's, why are people so apathetic? Why do you think uh, that? that? That's a great question. And I think um, scientists are also puzzled why, why the heck people aren't, you know, why the public isn't more embracing when we have all of this information, we have all this data that in fact show that, you know, climate change is happening, that this is going on. And I think that scientists tend to think that if we could only convince people, if we could only convey to people the scientific facts and figures of climate change, that we would be able to change their behaviors. And I don't think that's actually the case. I think people have to be moved by something other than just scientific facts. I don't know why that is, but I, because I myself am somebody who is convinced by scientific facts and figures. And so that's why I think it's so important for all of the climate scientists or scientists in general who want to make a difference to think about what is it that changes people? What is it that makes people change their behavior? What is it that, that make people think, oh, now I need to do something different? And it may not be the facts and figures. It may be something like Barbie. It may be something like sports. It may be something like something that moves them that isn't necessarily tied to science. And that's why I'm really trying to explore this idea that, that what we need to do is, or what scientists need to do, is to, is to empathize, to approach with humility groups like faith-based groups or sports groups or other groups that clearly have other values than just scientific values. And I think scientists have been doing a very poor job of that so far because they themselves, scientists themselves, are so convinced 
of their being right, of their having the facts, that they do not understand why people just don't get it. But we have to be, we as scientists have to be more humble. We have to be more listeners. We have to try to get what is it that will move people to make different choices or understand in a different way. And I don't think we've done a very good job of that, and I don't think we really know how to do that. I've been sort of stumbling along myself to do that. But I think that's the key, is, is not to be so convinced that we are right, but instead to say, well, yeah, we're right, but how is it that other people think they're right, and how do we juxtapose, how do we connect, how do we better understand other people's values so that we might link our values of reducing carbon footprints, carbon and carbon sequestration and so forth, that will make sense to them. So I, I guess I'm still in a questioning mode to answer your question. And I'm, I'm sorry I don't have a good answer, but I think the direction we need to move is, is that direction. Yes, ma'am. There are so many things I'd love to talk with you about in terms of science and humanities, but one thing I wanted to ask about is the position of the amateur scientist, the natural history buff or whatever. I have friends who, for example, live in the northern um, forest, which I assume is getting to 40 below right now, but they reach out just one-on-one -on -one with children, and even though these children are surrounded by your, the forest, they are spending time on video games and in watching television. And so they interact and bring them out into the woods and, and show them the birds and the leaves and have them build bird boxes and other things. So the place for the, for the amateur scientists or the amateur naturalists to reach one-on-one, -on -one, especially with children and young adults, even in a, a huge canopy forest, and try and bring the forest to them or them to their own forest. I think that idea of um, reaching out one-to-one -one is super duper important. Uh, one, one, one little um, statistic I'll give to you is that um, there are 325 million people in the United States. There's 6.2 million scientists and engineers. And if you do the math, you'll realize that if each of us scientists connected with just 52 people a year, 52 people a year, I'm, do the math of 325 divided by 6.2. If we just connect with 52 people a year, that's one person a week, one person a week, where you could have a conversation with your barista, with your, the person that delivers your newspaper, with you know, somebody whom you encounter once a week, we would, con we would connect with every single human in our country. And so a conversation, where, where is the person who just spoke? Yeah, so if you connect with one person a week with 52 people a year, and you have some meaningful connection about how important nature is, or how interesting it is, or how wonderful it is, or how fun it is, or how interesting it is, you know, that, if we all could do that here in this room, we would accomplish something amazing, which is, connecting with every single person in our country. And I think that when we get wrapped up with the bigness, like, oh my gosh, you know, I have to do a big program. Oh my gosh, I have to start a giant program. Oh my gosh, I have to work with the University of Oregon to get the funding to make some giant natural history program. No, I don't think we have to. I think what we really should be focusing on is the person who makes our coffee when we go to, you know, some coffee place and say, hey, you know about shade-grown coffee? You know that if actually people leave trees and coffee plantations, there's, there's a better opportunity for bird diversity to be maintained in tropical ecosystems? Or some, I don't even know what your, your conservation questions are here in, in Eugene, but if there's that personal connection on a single person level, at just one person a week, you'll be doing something really significant. I'm not saying that these big projects aren't important, that we should not be electing officials who will fight for us for the important questions that are going on. I'm just saying that we should not fall on the side of despair. 
when we think that we can't do anything. Because to me, the most important thing is to not fall on the side of despair. That is in this line between hope and despair, which all of us are walking right now. If we fall on the, too far on the side of hope, oh, somebody will fix it. Oh, the Environmental Humanities Program is doing such fantastic things here at the University of Oregon. I don't have to worry about it. Happy, happy, happy. That's not something that we want. But nor do we want to fall on the side of despair, which is I can't do anything about it, and therefore I won't do anything. I'm just going to go through my day drinking my coffee and, and, and doing whatever I do. So to me, as a person, as a scientist, as a conservationist, as someone who does want to have hope for this world, for this ecosystem, for these trees that exist on our campus and our planet, I think walking that line between despair and hope is extremely important. And the individual contribution to that is something that puts me back on the line of I'm walking despair and hope in a way that's, that's viable, that's important, that it's going to work. And so I don't, I don't want people to fall only on despair or only on hope. And what you're doing with the next generation is something that helps me stay on that line. Oh, sorry. Yes. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, well, I want to thank you so much for presenting this question and this challenge. Oh. Hello? Is that better? Yes. Oh, thank you. I wanted to thank you so much for presenting this challenge and this philosophical question. Um, I feel as if you're asking it at exactly the right moment, because it seems like we're at this turning point in history when we are more interconnected than we've ever been whether we want to be or not. But I also think we're at a moment, philosophically, at least in this country, maybe around the world, where we tend to frame issues in ways that divide us and cut us apart and make us feel as if it's impossible to communicate with people whose values are different than our own. And I appreciate the wild creativity of your solutions. They're inspiring. And one place I've seen that kind of wild creativity before is in talking with children. Um, for part of my work, I do philosophical outreach with children. We do philosophy discussions with children as young as kindergartners, right? And they have such incredible ways of seeing the world. And I wanted to know if you've worked with children, and also if you put this problem to them, ask them what they think about how you could try to reach people who don't see the world the way that you do when something's really important to you. Great question, thanks. Um, I work with children only indirectly. I think I, I see, because of my position as a professor in a university, uh, my children are my undergraduate students. But I recognize there are younger children also. And I'm also, I'm also a, a National Geographic explorer. And so I have the opportunity to talk to kids when I give talks to um, young kids in terms of National Geographic talks. And what I see is that there is this enormous, enormous love of the world, enormous love of nature, enormous desire to help, and they don't know quite how. And I, again, have to ask them, um, as I'm asking you guys, you know, what is it that I should be doing that might help them? And I, I don't know what that answer is. It's only a matter, I think, of reinforcing what I learned as a kid, which I transmit to them as a kid, which is the most important relationship I have ever had, and, and I don't want to tell my husband this, but my most important relationship actually is with nature, is with trees. Um, and so if I can guide them to feel that relationship, I, I sort of leave it in some ways up to them, as I do with my undergraduates and my graduate students and my colleagues, is if you have that connection, if you know it's important, then what is it that you can do? How will you find the ways to help trees? Just as when I was a kid, when I was eight years old, and I took my oath to, to somehow save trees, to protect trees, I didn't know at that time that it would be through ecology. I didn't know at that time that it would be through academia. I didn't know at that time it would be giving talks like this that might help nature. 
but they have to find their way with their, their new ways of communicating that I have no, I still have no idea, you know, I'm not on, on, on Facebook, I'm not on Instagram, but that's what they use. So maybe they have different ways of communicating and promoting nature in ways that I don't even know how to advise them. So I think my role in terms of what I can do is to say for me, this primary connection with nature, with trees in specific, but nature in general, is, 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 is the gift that I can give to them and the invitation I can give to them for them to figure out what it will take for them to help nature. Just as I have found a way through academia, through environmental humanities, through these talks, through my writings, that I have found a way to try to my best to help nature. But I don't think that I can tell them how because I don't know what that will be. It's only the sense of connection, the sense of the importance of that connection, the, the example that I can provide, the joy in that connection that I have felt that I can communicate to them. Thank you. Hi, Nalini. Uh, I really appreciate the, the, bar, the Barbie and Kane thing. It's like open the like a imagination for kids, I, I suppose. Um, so uh, I'm a landscape student, so my question would be is a little bit specific, I suppose. Um, so my first question is um, one of the frustration in Taiwan. Oh, can you? Uh, one of the frustration in Taiwan that people afraid of canopy, canopy. Um, falling down from typhoon, which is like hurricane, thing. Um, especially like around urban sidewalks, and so like people actually cut down the branches uh, before the typhoon came, be before the typhoon comes, and um, I was wondering, um, and it, it, and it actually made the branches structurally weaker, and so I was wondering like, have you ever? seen something um, similar and um, what's your suggestion on that and it's actually a very big um, negative impact to like uh, canopy habitat habitat animals um, yeah that's my first question um, the second question is from a like a design ecology standpoint um, what's your thinking or what's your opinion on um, like a the tree canopy in built environment versus tree canopies in natural environment, mm. and um, what like how they inform each other is one is more important than the other, or is it equivalently import important? Like, what's your point of view, or is there the gradient between like natural environment and um, urban like built environment? Um, did, did I make it clear? Sorry. Well, I guess I would invite you to be my graduate student so that we could spend five years <laughs> discussing. <laughs> yeah, I'm a grad student in landscape yeah. architecture. Oh, well, yeah. well, I a project already. But it sounds like you're talking about two things. One is the dangers of, of forest canopies in an, in an urban environment, uh, which is a very, pardon me? Tropical urban environment. Tropical urban environment. Uh, and the other is... <coughs> Yeah, I guess I, you know, I'll sort of back out on that. Uh, in terms of, can you hear me? Is this, is this still on? Yeah. Um, that most canopy research, myself included, has been in primary forest, you know, sort of arenas. And so what we know about forest canopies has mainly been with, with primary forests. And so there's been very little research. Uh, to our own detriment that has been, has been going on in terms of urban environments. I think there's a growing interest in sort of urban tree environments, urban canopies, how important they are in terms of mitigating um, urban heat islands and that sort of thing. But I don't think there's really been much research on the dangers of forest canopies in terms of, of, of urban ecosystems and, and people who live in urban environments. So I, I don't have much that I can provide you with in terms of those questions, which is why I invite you to be a graduate student in, in that area, because I think you could 
create some very interesting information. Um, you know, so, so I guess that answers sort of both questions, that I, I can't really advise you or provide you information on, on this sort of urban versus primary forest canopy information. I'm sorry, yeah. Did you have a question? Yeah. I met you when I was back at Evergreen. It's nice to see you again. And um, we just went through the, some of my favorite places like the Suzla Falls Swimming Hole and Clay Creek, my brother here from Hawaii, and Whitaker Creek. And I hope all you're here, you get a chance to check out some of these places that, for me, coming from Olympia, have just grabbed my heart. And um, seeing the differences in the canopy and filing, feeling home here because I know them. Um, this is an awkward hit. <laughs> One of the things that I was thinking about when you're talking about people who are incarcerated is their medical rights and having nature prescribed almost in the same way as a pharmaceutical would be, would be a really interesting idea for possibly making sure that their rights aren't infringed. For example, if a doctor were to prescribe nature, you know, exactly like a pill, and that they have to take it, that's part of their regimen. Could that somehow force the, sy force the system to um, recognize some of those rights? And that could apply to a lot of institutions. But really, <laughs> when it comes down to it, I think the true um, incarceration that we all have is one of um, our perception of what is convenient in the way of what we exchange for long term. Uh, goals as fast, or pardon me, long-term successes compared to short-term conveniences, and that's what I'm struck with every day. Those, those choices that seem small, that in fact together become really huge. But yeah, what it really got me thinking about was um, could nature be prescribed in a way that it's able to be backed up by legislation? Yeah. yeah I'm nervous uh, talking, I don't Hi, everybody. <laughs> yeah, so. No, I, I think that's a very real thing. And I think that's one of the things that we have learned from working with cons bringing conservation to inmates is that, in fact, uh, this is therapeutic. It's, it's not just something to keep them busy. It's not just something to increase their social interactions. But there is something that I think all populations who are nature-deprived or any population that when you work with nature, when you, when, you, when you grow plants or you foster um, uh, animals, you know, that, that will then have a chance outside to increase biodiversity or help the planet. There's something very, very wonderful and therapeutic about it. And in fact, the, the uh, Washington State Department of Corrections has actually started thinking about using what we've been doing as what they call opportunities to contribute, OTC. So they're talking about OTC units. This guy needs 10 hours a week in the gardens. This guy needs 20 you know, hours per week with the frogs. This guy needs you know, 15 hours a week with the, with the prairie plant uh, plug growing. And so I think what, what people who are in the Department of Corrections have come to understand is that this opportunity to contribute through nature, through the fostering of nature, is actually something that's extremely therapeutic, extremely conducive to, to shifting the self-identity, what I think of as shifting the self-identity of, of inmates to something, that's, to something that says, oh, I can understand this, but also I can contribute, and therefore, I'm something other than what has been told to me, which is I'm a bad person, I'm not reparable, I can't do anything, I, I'm a terrible father, I'm an awful spouse, or whatever. So, so that opportunity to contribute through fostering nature has been to us a, and us by me, me and my colleagues who have been working with this, has been a sort of this unexpected benefit of, of, of bringing science education and conservation projects to the incarcerated, which is that it's not just job training so that you know how to write things in a notebook, 
but it's about saying, I, I am helping something. I am helping someone. I am helping the earth. And that turns out to be important, not just for you and me, who are privileged here in Eugene, Oregon, but it also turns out to be true of people who maybe haven't been given that opportunity before. And to me, that's a very strong motivator in all of the work that we're doing, difficult as it is, with, to, to bring conservation projects to the incarcerated and to people, anybody who's, who doesn't have that opportunity. Thanks. Hello. So my question is, um, what are, the, what are the thoughts, the avenue of thoughts, and what are the threads of um, threads of values that uh, that you may have considered in exploring how you can connect uh, people with nature and the the ecological value that it can uh, provide the rest of society? Uh, say that again. So how you so how you can um, uh, what other Threads of values or avenues of thought have you considered uh, to integrate? I've, I've tried to think as broadly as I can, but I, I really think there's no limit. I really think that you know there are cooking values of nature. Uh, you know, I, I think people here in Oregon probably already know about Portland already, or Eugene already know about that. I, I mean, I pursue these recreational values, these aesthetic values, these social justice values, but really you can start you know, thinking about any sort of values that, that you could use to connect nature with other people. And, and even as extreme as sports value, I mean, like if you think about these wooden bats, like that's pretty, oh yeah, that, that's a value that people have. So I, I guess what my, when I challenge my students, when I challenge my colleagues to think about you know, what is it that you can think about that might be of value to other people? There's really no limit to it. And like, for example, um, I have this program called the STEM Ambassador Program where we train scientists to, to connect with, with public audiences that are outside of museums or zoos or, you know, just sort of the typical way that most scientists do that. And, you know, we have a microbiologist who studies microbial populations. She's given a talk about microbes in a cooking class, you know, a fermentation cooking class, because people who take this fermentation class really want to know about how to better make kimchi or sauerkraut. And so she can talk about microbes. And, and they really want to know, because that's of value to them. And so I think it's really unlimited in terms of the ways that we can connect the values that we have uh, in terms of understanding the world through science with, with other people's values. It's just that you have to sort of get yourself out of your own world to, to sort of do that and be creative and expand your mind a little bit about how to do that. And, and then once that happens, it's really fun because like this woman who went to a fermentation cooking class, like people had questions for her that she really hadn't thought about. And, and it was a, a wonderful, enlightening experience for her. But it just sort of took that a little bit of stepping outside of what we normally think about um, to go ahead and do that. And, and that's what I think is kind of fun and exciting about, about this kind of public engagement. It's Thank like, you. think about what other people value. Thank you. Yes. Hello. I was curious to hear. Um, more about what you said to Playboy magazine that got them interested in trees. Could you say that again? I was curious to hear what you said to Playboy magazine that got them interested in oh, trees. Yeah, uh, that's really interesting. I mean, unfortunately, I wasn't the centerfold. I was, I was kind of too old for that. But um, they approached me, and they wanted to know about um, they wanted to know about uh, creative professors, and so I was one of their. Uh, 20 uh, Playboy honor roll, most creative professors in the United States. And so I talked to them about the prison work that I've been doing, and that seemed to be what was of interest to them. Um, and at first I thought, Playboy magazine, like who, uh, forget it, you know, that's such a terrible magazine, how awful that is, so exploitative. But then I thought, well, who reads Playboy? You know, people who maybe wouldn't 
read natural history. So yeah, let's let's get it to Playboy for goodness sake. And so that that's what I that's when I thought yeah go right ahead. And so I was kind of grateful that they thought that that was interesting and important. Hi, oh, loud. Um, so yeah, I was thinking about uh, essentially the core issue here is like how do we get enough of the world to care about uh, the environment and environmental sustainability such that we can last for long enough to be a, a species that survives whatever we're going through right now. It seems like the way that you're approaching this problem is like let's talk to as many people as we can that don't share these beliefs and see if we can bring them into like the fold of understanding of like these things, these issues matter. But maybe if you sort of inverted that process and instead um, started from places of uh, where our bases that are already involved in it, that already care about these types of things uh, and uh, get them together and figure out like what they care about and why they care about. Sort of instead of starting to bring people in to sort of make a strong core base and then grow outward from there. It seems like from a political science marketing point of view, the idea of figuring out what this base cares about, what shared values they care about, what brought them together, what way of life got everyone here to begin with. You figure out what are other high probability maybe groups that you could actually go to and talk to where there'd be a high conversion rate. It seems like if you focus initially on, uh, on groups that are completely foreign, there's going to be a low probability of actually understanding and absorbing what you're saying. But if you start from groups that maybe share a lot of the same uh, similar experiences to others, it might be an immediate place where you could go there and then get people uh, from ways that they understand speaking languages that they understand about why this matters and then get a lot of people to come. And maybe that would be the best way to make like uh, some type of core political movement that you could actually make legislation around conservation laws from if you have like a strong political base. So it seems like instead of actually going around and talking to low probability conversion rates of people that don't share like similar life values that bring them into environmentalism, to start from essentially uh, people that have a high probability to associate themselves with these groups and then embolden a central base around the idea of environmentalism, political activism, and use that as a stepping ground to enact legislation. And I think that would have the, the benefit of then being a, a socially engaging movement that would be sort of self-reinforcing because people want to be involved in things that are popular and fun and interesting that their peers are associated with. So it could be a, a way that you could actually put a lot of momentum into this without it actually putting a lot of energy into convincing people to change their minds, which is extremely difficult. Uh, so let me just summarize what I think you said, which is maybe we should go to popular, if, if we want to make a difference, we should go to groups that are more like thinking of us in order to create a coalition that would be more powerful. Is that, is that right? Uh, yeah, essentially, if you go to groups that have a high probability of hearing what you have to say, yeah. it will be more of a probability of actually growing Got the it. movement of environmentalism. As opposed to going to like totally weirdo out there populations that clearly wouldn't care what you say. People that have difficulty understanding why, yeah. why trees are important. Well, that's, I mean, I think there are many ways of uh, approaching this. And I think that, you know, if you, if you talk to people who, or say it's scientists like me, who have some message about how important trees are, well, where should I go to talk to people? Well, I should go to a natural history museum where people who bring their kids to talk about natural history, they'd be coming there, right? But I feel like, Great, they already, they're already there. You know, they're already there. They're already there. And it seems to me like what my work, what I, I choose to do is to say, what about the people who don't go there? What about people who don't bring their kids to, who aren't part of a population that are already part of our coalition? And I think that one piece of Science, one part of one group of scientists who might do something are people like me who want to go beyond that, who want to bring people who might not necessarily be part of our coalition into our coalition by finding common ground with them. And I don't see anything wrong with scientists who say, yeah, I'm going to go talk at a museum because there are people who are part of my world who already get it. I, I think that's a good thing, but I also feel like maybe it's time for some of us to say, how about those people who aren't already part of our coalition? And how do we, and asking the question of how do we get to them? And, and, and maybe there's a, there's a small probability that they might come around. 
All right, I guess maybe I, I was talking too fast and I didn't actually explain it, but um, I was thinking like, if you understand why your coalition values what they do, then you can use what they value to figure out people who already don't come, but maybe where the people who don't come but would come would be, and go to them first as a stepping stone to bring them in. No, I, I, that's what I'm thinking. I think maybe you and I are thinking the same things. Uh, maybe I didn't express it as well. Sorry, I don't want this to become a yeah. monopolized conversation. Yeah. So. Maybe we can have a little talk afterwards. Great. Maybe I don't need to do this on the microphone, but I just want to sincerely thank you. <clears throat> I'm not good at public speaking. Um, I want to sincerely thank you because I'm a living example of someone you reached. Um, I saw one of your articles in Nat Geo when I was a little girl, and I love climbing trees, and um, I'm from South Dakota, and I moved out here and got a job with the Forest Service trying to um, save rare lichens and bryophytes. So thank you, because you touched me. Thanks for telling me that, thanks. And this last question. Yeah, I was... Um, wondering about if there was any research done whether like forest imagery had more or less impact than being in nature when it came to inmates or people in hospitals or any other group. Uh, say that again, can you? So if people like got better from sickness quicker oh, yeah. or were less violent because of nature imagery or actually being in nature, there's a difference. Yes, there, there definitely are studies that have shown that, uh, both in terms of physical recovery uh, in hospitals where people have looked at nature versus not looked at nature, and also this idea of fewer violent infractions. So yes, there are definitely studies that have shown that. I was meaning more like if the people were like physically in nature versus if they saw. Oh, the that's a good question. Yeah. Uh, no, there have been um, studies that have looked at sort of virtual nature versus real nature, and clearly, really being in nature is better than not being in nature. But even just seeing nature or hearing nature soundscapes still has a positive effect in terms of the the therapeutic values of it. So it's not like we're saying you can replace nature with just nature imagery, that, that actually experiencing nature is better, in fact. But, um, but if you're in a nature-deprived area, even seeing or hearing nature is better than not. Yeah. Please